Welcome back to Biomechanics. Recall that last time we used the increment of work dw done by the stress t in producing an increment of strain d epsilon to derive a new form of the constitutive law for elasticity in which the stress components dij are computed from the partial derivatives of w with respect to the strain components, where w, the work per unit volume, is known as the strain energy density or strain energy function. In this example, we use the Cauchy stress and the Cauchy strain epsilon. The definition of the Cauchy stress tensor is given by Cauchy's formula. Because the traction vector Tn and the outward normal vector n are defined in the current or deformed state of the body, the Cauchy stress, as we have defined it, is an Eulerian quantity. To put it another way, Tij is the component in the xj direction of the traction vector Tn acting on the phase normal to the xi axis, where xj and xi are in the deformed state of the body. For this reason, the Cauchy stress T is referred to as the true or physical stress. However, like the strain tensor, there are also Lagrangian definitions of stress. There are actually two Lagrangian stress tensors. The first is known as the nominal stress, S. It's technically only half Lagrangian because like the deformation gradient tensors, one of its two indices, the one relating to the outward normal, now refers to the outward normal, capital N, defined for the surfaces in the undeformed state of the body. This stress definition is sometimes useful, for example, in experimental measurement, where we do not have to measure the cross-sectional area at every new deformed state of the material. We will not prove it, but it can be shown that S is related to the Cauchy stress T by det F, F inverse T, and because of this F inverse here, we see a disadvantage of S, is that S is not necessarily symmetric, because F and therefore F inverse are not necessarily symmetric. So this is inconvenient. If we convert both indices from deformed to undeformed coordinates, we arrive at the symmetric, fully Lagrangian, second piola kirchhoff stress tensor P. It's defined as follows. P equals S times F inverse transpose, which is det F times F inverse times T times F inverse transpose, which is symmetric. In index notation, PRS equals det F times del big XR del little xi del big XS del little xj times Tij. So you can see that the deformation gradient tensors inverses here are converting indices in the deformed coordinates to indices in the undeformed coordinates. And det F arises because of the calculation of the area. This stress tensor has the advantage that it's fully Lagrangian and symmetric, so it's useful mathematically, but it does not lend itself to quite such a simple physical interpretation as the Cauchy or nominal stresses. It is simply a definition of the stress where the traction and area vectors are referred to coordinates in the original undeformed state instead of the current deformed state in which those tractions actually exist. For small deformations, the differences between the Cauchy, second piola kirchhoff and nominal stresses vanish. It's easier to appreciate these different definitions of the stress tensor if we use a simple one-dimensional example. Imagine that we have a sample subjected to uniaxial loading with undeformed length L and undeformed cross-sectional area A, and after the application of tensile force F, the new length is little l and the new cross-sectional area in the deformed state is little a. The one by one deformation gradient tensor would be the same as the stretch tensor because there's no rotation in one dimension, which would therefore be little l over big L or the stretch ratio lambda. The Cauchy stress in one dimension, T11, would be little f over a, the deformed area. Now the nominal stress S is the determinant of F times F inverse times T. So in 1D, we get S11 is det F times F11 inverse times T11. Well, the determinant of F is the volume ratio of deformed to undeformed volume. F inverse is the inverse of little l over big L, so it's big L over little l. And T is F over A. 
Now the deformed volume is little l times little a. The undeformed volume is big L times big A times big L over little l times f over a. And you can see these terms cancel to give us f over big A. So the nominal stress is just the stress but measured per unit undeformed area. The second piola kirchhoff stress, the one that's symmetric and fully Lagrangian, is S11 or S times F inverse. So S11 times F11 inverse is F over big A times big L over little l. So you can see that this is still has units of stress and it's still related to stress, but it's just scaled by the inverse of the stretch ratio. So it doesn't have as useful immediate physical interpretation. So why would we be interested in this unusual stress? Well, the answer is that the most intuitive strain measure is the Lagrangian strain. So if we want to write the constitutive law as a function of Lagrangian strain components, we should use it to evaluate a Lagrangian stress in which both components refer to undeformed coordinates. So by analogy with our original derivation of the constitutive law for hyperelasticity, we can show that the equivalent for finite elasticity is the second piola kirchhoff stress, P, determined from the derivatives of the strain energy, W, with respect to the Lagrangian strain, ERS, or in terms of the right cauchy green deformation tensor, PRS is del W del CRS plus del W del CSR, which we could also write as one half del W del ERS plus del W del ESR. Now, since the strain is symmetric, this expression is also valid. However, this form, while being a bit longer, does serve to remind us that the stress tensor and the strain tensor are symmetric, and therefore the stress-strain relation must respect those symmetries. For example, a partial derivative of W with respect to E12 means holding E21 constant and vice versa, so that when we write W, we should have equal terms for E12 and E21, so that the resulting stress is symmetric. Then, since the second piola kirchhoff stress is not as physically useful as the Cauchy stress T, having computed the second piola kirchhoff stress from del W del ERS, we then convert it back to the Cauchy stress using the formula on the previous slide, which in index notation is det f inverse or rho over rho naught times del xi del big xi del little xj del big xs. So you can see that these transformations are transforming the components of the piola kirchhoff stress in undeformed coordinates to Cauchy stress components referred to deformed coordinates. So let's look at some strain energy functions, starting with the simplest case of isotropic materials as we did for linear elasticity. One way to ensure that the stress-strain relation is isotropic is to write W as a function of I1, I2, and I3, where I1, I2, and I3 are the principal invariants of the right cauchy green deformation tensor, given, as you recall, by the trace of C for I1. I2 is one half of the trace of C squared minus the trace of C squared, and I3 is the determinant of C. Since these invariants are invariant under rotations, a stress-strain law written as a function of them will be isotropic. So if we have W as a function of the principal invariants, how do we get the Piola-Kirchhoff stresses? Well, recall that the Piola-Kirchhoff stress is del W del CRS, so applying the chain rule, we can compute the derivatives of W with respect to I1, I2, and I3, and then multiply them by the partial derivatives del I1 del CRS, del I2 del CRS, and del I3 del CRS. Now, since I1, I2, and I3 are known functions of C, we can compute these. So the first one, for example, del I1 del CRS, is easy. It's just delta RS. In other words, the derivative of I1 with respect to CRS is 1 when I and J are 1, 2, or 3, or 0 when I and J are not equal to each other. With a little more effort, we can show that del I2 del CRS, so the derivative of this function with respect to CRS, will be I1 delta RS minus CRS. Easiest way to convince yourself of this is just to write this out for each case. So compute del I2 del C11, then del I2 del C12, del I2 del C13, etc., and you'll see that this correctly gives each response. And then finally, the 
partial derivatives of the determinant of C with respect to C RS turn out to be I1 times delta RS minus I1 times C RS plus CRP times CSP. The algebra to prove this is actually quite long. Here are some examples of real isotropic strain energy functions used for biological tissues and other materials. The mooney rivlin material, or the simplest special case where C2 equals zero, known as the Neo-Hookian material, uh, are often used for simple elastomers like rubber. The exponential isotropic strain energy function, C1 e to the alpha I1 minus three, all minus one, plus C2 times I2 minus three, is known as the Veronda Westman model and has been used for skin and heart muscle and other tissues with an exponent alpha of approximately five. Ogden proposed a power law in terms of the principal stretch ratios lambda one, lambda two, and lambda three. And so in Ogden's expression, W is C times lambda one to the alpha plus lambda two to the alpha plus lambda three to the alpha. Because the coefficients of lambda one, two, and three are all the same, this is an isotropic strain energy function, and it only has two coefficients, C and alpha. And finally, a Hooke's law can actually be uh, written, of course, as a strain energy function, and the isotropic version of Hooke's law would be one half of lambda times delta ij, delta kl, epsilon ij, epsilon kl, plus mu times delta ik, delta jl, plus delta il, delta jk, times epsilon ij, epsilon kl. However, this isn't useful for finite nonlinear elasticity because Hooke's law is only valid for infinitesimal Cauchy strings. This exponential strain energy function of two-dimensional Lagrangian strains is anisotropic. B1 here determines the uniaxial properties in the x1 direction. B2 determines the uniaxial properties in the x2 direction, and B3 determines the interactions between the x1 and x2 directions i.e. the effects of E22 on T11 and the effects of E11 on T22. This allows for the kind of complex nonlinear interactions between strain and two directions, as seen here, for example, uh, in testing of blood vessels, where here you see the length of the vessel uh, and the force, and the different curves represent the force-length relation when the vessel is being stretched, if the vessel is also being inflated to different pressures. And you can see that there's a complex interaction between the circumferential stress due to pressure inflation and the longitudinal stress associated with axial strain. Here's an orthotropic exponential strain energy function proposed for arteries that has seven parameters. It has this overall coefficient here, and then Q has six coefficients, one for stress in the radial direction, circumferential direction, and axial direction, and then interaction terms between each of those three different directions. The units of the numbers shown here uh, in the strain energy function are kilopascals for this 10. These exponents are all dimensionless. And because we differentiate W with respect to strain, which is dimensionless, the stress also has units of kilopascals. The numbers were proposed based on tests in rabbit thoracic arteries. However, for aorta, which is not a simple exponential stress-strain relation, uh, Holzapfel and Weissacker proposed a modification that actually worked a little bit better. Their law was 33.6 times I1 minus 3 plus 4.2 times e to the q minus 1, where q was the same exponent seen here. So what they did is they added a linear term to the exponential stress-strain law. And the result of that can be seen here. The solid lines represent experimental measurements of circumferential stress versus circumferential strain and axial stress versus circumferential strain. And the dotted dashed line here represents the original strain energy function, whereas the dashed star line seen here and here, which are a closer approximation to the experiment, represent the modified uh, strain energy function. This transversely isotropic exponential strain energy function has only three parameters, 0.76, 2.3, and 117. In this function, lambda f represents the stretch ratio in the collagen fiber direction of the mitral valve. Despite only having three coefficients, 
This strain energy function does an impressive job of fitting a whole range of biaxial experiments, including a 2 to 1 off biaxial test, a strip biaxial test, and an equibiaxial test in mitral valve tissue. If a tissue is incompressible, then the strain alone cannot determine the stress because any hydrostatic pressure can be added to the stress without affecting the strain. Because we've added a new constraint equation, namely the kinematic incompressibility constraint, that I3 or the determinant of F squared is equal to 1, we also introduce a new unknown variable P known as the hydrostatic pressure variable. This enters the strain energy as a Lagrange multiplier to prevent the derivative of the strain energy tending to infinity. When we derive the stress from this modified strain energy function that includes this pressure variable uh, as a Lagrange multiplier, then the pressure enters the stress as an additional term. It's negative because a positive pressure is a negative normal stress. And when we convert the second piola kirchhoff stress back to a Cauchy stress, this will just be minus P delta Ij. So this formulation allows us to enforce the constraint that I3 equals 1 and introduce a new variable, which is the unknown hydrostatic pressure, that is needed to account for the fact that we have an additional constraint. And then we can use our other equations uh, to solve for this hydrostatic pressure, given that we've made use of our incompressibility constraint to constrain the strains. Another approach that avoids the need for an additional unknown is called slightly compressible material models. We add a term to the strain energy that represents the volume change with the material parameter k that controls the degree of incompressibility or compressibility. For real soft tissues that are nearly incompressible, K is normally about two orders of magnitude larger than the other material constants. So here is a common formulation for slightly compressible materials in which W is a function of I1 and I2, but not I3, which is nearly one. And we add another term, which is a function of J, which is the square root of I3, with this coefficient K that represents like a bulk modulus for the material, and is usually much bigger than the other coefficients, thereby ensuring that the volume doesn't change very much. So in summary, in nonlinear elasticity, we've seen that soft tissues have nonlinear material properties. Because the strain rate effects are modest, soft tissues can be approximated as elastic, and this is the pseudo-elasticity assumption. Strain energy W relates stress to strain in a hyperelastic material, and it arises from changes in internal energy or entropy with loading. For finite deformations, it is most convenient to use the Lagrangian second piola kirchhoff stress. Exponential strain energy functions are common for soft tissues, and for isotropic materials, W is a function of the principal strain invariance. Transverse isotropy and orthotropy can be handled by introducing additional terms or invariants. For incompressible material, an additional pressure enters the problem. 